You're listening to WLPN LP Chicago, 1055 FM, Lumpen Radio, Bridgeport. It's October 12, 2017. You're listening to the Beer Double Insiders Roundtable. We almost got it. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard, seen from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard, seen from again, 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 again. So close, so close. I do like, though, that the regulars can tell who the producer is within the first one second of the show. So, um, <laughs> well, welcome everyone to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Quinn, coming to you once again from the Co-Prosperity Sphere, Studio B to be exact, here in beautiful Bridgeport, Chicago. Thanks, as always, to Lumpin' Radio and its fearless leader, Logan Bay, for having us on. Thanks to producer John and producer Jamie as well. And thanks to all of you who are out there listening via the airway. Via? Via? Does it matter? We've got some English experts here who aren't paying attention. Um, do you know, Kate? Are you in English? Oh, no. Nah. Okay. So... Anyway, if you are listening via the airwaves at 105.5 FM, thank you. Be that actual terrestrial radio, or if you are listening on the Lumpen app or in TuneIn Radio, thank you. If you are listening live, feel free to hop into the live chat at tlk.io slash WLPN and uh, correct everything that I get wrong, such as the pronunciation of via. <laughs> And anything that you want. Um, if you aren't listening live, if you're listening to us in podcast form, thanks to you as well for um, for for joining us. And if you want to contribute, uh, you can always send a letter. We'll get to that later. Or you can uh, help us out with our ratings and reviews on, on iTunes. Um so, yeah, I guess a little bit of news on that side of things, not to toot my own horn, but last week was a, a week ago today, maybe, or a week ago tomorrow, uh, we were named by the North American Guild of Beer Writers, I believe, is who it was, Accurate. as the, yep. the best podcast beer podcast in the galaxy. In the galaxy. Yep. Yeah, so not quite the, there's billions of galaxies, though. So I'm shooting for universe right, next the time. The one in Andromeda 72A yeah. kicks your butt. I know. I know. I know. But are you a member, Josh? Of I Rome? am. I won a first place award as well. You I did? Won, Congratulations. I won, oh, I won that's right. Best, Two years in a row, right? Uh, actually, I've won something four years in a row. Uh, but I won first place in best local reporting uh, for two years in a row. Cool. So Congrats, it was, man. Thank you. And actually- the Wack Factory was <laughs> was quoted in that article, so thank you, Kate. Thank you, Wack. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. It was an, it was an article it's about fact. I like uh, that everybody's <laughs> called by their social media handles. Well, yeah, I Wack Factory is is, <laughs> is pretty much the awesomest. That's a good one. Handle ever. Uh, Kate Tronica is good too. Yeah, which is another nickname. I haven't made that Twitter account yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're Just waiting. Give it enough time. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, what was the? Oh, it was it was an article about uh, the beers uh, that echo cocktails movement. Yes, um, and the the hook was Forbidden Root, the brew pub over there on Chicago Avenue, uh, did a collaboration with Fernet Branca, everyone's mm -hmm. second favorite bitter spirit in this town. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the hook, but then Pipeworks has done a bunch of them, so that you know, in a good story, you sort of you have your hook and your your way into the broader topic, and then the broader for the broader topic, I turned to Kate, aka Whack Factory, and she talked about some of the cool things that Pipeworks has done in that in that same vein, and uh, 
Yeah, one. So thanks, judges, if you happen to be listening. And uh, actually, I know one of the judges in your category. Oh, really? I'm not supposed to say who it is. But, okay, you don't have to. But say. he was very impressed with your show. Oh, cool. Well, Kate was on one of the episodes that was submitted. So, so really, I, I think we're awards. seeing, <laughs> yeah, who we That's have. What we're to getting thank. to. You're yeah, welcome, both of someone's you. really into the whack. You know. <laughs> um, so Good. I think we should. Uh, Let's get to formal introductions. I have no idea what order it would go in. So you, we've already basically introduced two of the three. So Josh Noel of the Chicago Tribune. Correct. And other things. What is new with you, man? Thanks for coming on. And I know Thanks. that this is a not really where you would like to be right now. Well, the Cubs are losing 4-1 last I checked, so you know what? I'm perfectly happy to be sitting here with you guys and drinking some hazy IPA. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Soon to be followed by this lovely barrel-aged farmhouse ale. Yes. Yeah, everything's good. It's been busy again lately in Chicago beer. Actually, the last week has been really hopping, so we've got a lot to talk about tonight, which is cool. And as you know, Chris, and I think anyone who's ever read a single one of my tweets, I can be a little self-deprecating, self-deprecating at this point about the fact that I talk a lot about my book. Uh, my book is currently in the copy editing stage, so that's exciting. And I have a the covers out, the title has been announced, we have a release date. So uh, I'm starting to put some of the trauma of actually writing a book behind me. And awesome. uh, make no mistake, writing a book is a horrible, horrible process. <laughs> but I'm, I'm excited for it to come out and you know, that's, that's cool. To stimulate some conversation. And now can hopefully. you officially say what the title is? Because you've hinted at it before. I have, show. yeah. The title, and it's actually this has been the title for a long, long time, but it was only the working title for a long time. And I figured it would be replaced, but no one came up with a better one. Uh, so the title is Barrel Age Stout and Selling Out, Goose Island, Anheuser-Busch, and How Craft Beer Became Big Business. Oh, nice. And dun, dun, dun. The, the cover of the book I'm pretty pleased with. Yeah, it was, I was going to workshop pretty hard by many people um it it's a picture of a stout presumably a barrel aged stout of the title and then there's a crack in the glass too um my uh, question is is that a real crack or is that photoshop everyone asks that and you know what i don't know the answer okay. i assume it's photoshop it has to be it has I would to be think. yeah uh, otherwise my publisher has the best art director ever right and the wouldn't the beer like leak out you would dribble think? And right sloppy. Yeah. right yeah. yeah so probably Science. it's it, but it's it's a it's a good it's a good airbrush it is good and so the crack represents um you know, some people are like, ouch, you know, are you, are you talking about Goose Island there? And it's really the crack sort of just represents the the fracture, I guess, um, that's sort of just happened in the industry since that sale back in 2011. Hmm. Maybe we'll get into a little bit of that sure. later on the show. I did completely forget <clears throat> to say my, my opening thing, which we'll, we'll skip for maybe the first time ever, uh, one of the first times ever, uh, some stuff going on in Studio A. All right. There's some weirdness going on. There's a, uh, a well, there's a sound check going on, but there's also a alien spaceship hanging out in Studio A. It's a pinata. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Maybe but a it's, submarine. But Maybe? it's huge. I mean, it's I mean, it's like a 15 foot long, pin wide, whatever you want to call it, pinata. By I feel like the, six the, or seven feet high. The listeners must be able to hear this because I think we're hearing it in the headphones, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. There's somebody doing like uh, looks like a stand-up routine or practicing. There's aliens mm-hmm. coming out of the spaceship and oh. slowly. We're uh, gonna die. <laughs> is that? I wonder if that's uh, the Borg master. Is that his? no? He wouldn't. He'd have a nicer one than that. <laughs> that looks. Nicer, that's kind yeah. of a low run one. No offense. <laughs> so one thing that I, I I will skip the the little spiel I give, but I will say that everyone's opinions are their own. I don't want Logan to uh, come down at me for not saying that. Um, so everyone's opinions are their own, not the opinions of Lumpin' Radio. And I'll just leave it there. Maybe it is the opinions of Beer Temple this time. Who knows? Maybe they aren't. Could Maybe be. they are, but I'm not going to say. I'm going to leave that out out there, you know? Freak people out a little bit. Um, so anyway, my next guest is uh, <laughs> Ms. Factory. Uh, Kate Branken of Hello. Pipeworks. How are you? Doing good. Yeah? What's new with you? I, I think there's a whole lot new. Uh, I mean, in in the last last week or so, not so much. Um, just kind of we've moved some new tanks into the brewery, um, the biggest ones we've ever had. And we were I was just talking with Tim, who's next to me right now, and we were just saying that, 
you don't really realize what that's going to feel like. Uh, and it accidentally got moved by coincidence next to the smallest tank at the previous first facility that we had. And the smallest or the largest? Oh, the largest tank at the, at the last facility we had. And just seeing the comparison was uh, kind of crazy. And it's also yeah. kind of fitting that Garrett, the owner or the founder of Pipeworks, posted on his Facebook, or maybe on, on his personal or, or on Pipeworks Facebook page, your original brewery location, yeah. which is straight up non-existent. It's just like rubble now. Luxury condos. Oh, no. Uh, that, that was awesome. Awesome. I think that's what it's going to be. Uh, but it was it was demolished. Um, I mean, not a huge loss in the building, yeah. but um, the memories. Good thing that we have the memories. <laughs> We'll always have them. Yes. But it's good because Chicago really needs more condos. So, <laughs> yeah. you know yeah, what? Exactly. I say I say more condos. Yep. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yep. And More condos, fewer awning shops, turn breweries without drain floors, and excellent overhead lights and heat. Yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I remember watching you guys. Uh, just It was a drain in the floor, and you would just take poses and kind of snake them well, down. Well, it, the, it was at the high point of the floor was the drain. And... <laughs> It was also on like underneath the kettle, so it was like a group effort, and we, everyone would have to do it at once. So we had like a fleet of squeegees, and we would all have to squeegee like with a plan of attack. Oh, so right, because it would just flow like, somewhere pat, else. Yeah, you'd have to like get the water to. I mean, it was we, yeah. I honestly, about an I didn't hour know. Every day. I didn't know how that. I didn't know all that about it, but I do know that I had come in a couple times. You always like to do that, Josh. <laughs> you could see. He it's was dramatic. He was glug, so, glug, glug, like, glug, he had glug. this, like, self... Uh, Watch this. Yeah, like, when he cracked it, he was, like, this little sly little look. Um, but uh, anyway, I do remember there would be times where I'd just walk in and say, Hey, guys. And one time you were doing a squeegee thing, and you were like, Oh, hey, Chris. And you were very very much about the task at hand. Yeah. And I remember you okay. were just like squeegeeing water down in a little drain. <laughs> I mean, it was like it was an hour water. It was like every hop day. water. It was, yeah. it was like work. Yeah. It was a, a lot of my life I've wondered, like, if I really sat down and thought, how much of my life have I thought, like, moving yeah. water across a floor into a small drain? <laughs> I mean, it adds thing. up. You don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. Hours Tim knows what, it, what, what that's about. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, Tim, you you probably came from an even smaller original brewery than uh, than Pipeworks. Also in a probably residential, originally built as a residential yeah. or or maybe light commercial at best. Don't turn those into breweries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that you were afraid was going to collapse. I think you also share that. There were some fears of the structural integrity, hey, I believe. I'm, just, I'm not an engineer, you know. I don't know. These, these tanks had these triangular legs and you just, you know, I don't know. Don't know how much they can support. And uh, well, um, uh, Tim Lang, my final guest, head brewer. Head, what's your title at, at Mars? Head brewer. Head brewer. Okay, mm-hmm. I don't want to say brewmaster. No, not, no, yeah, no. Just Let's head brewer. That. Yeah, that's fine. How are you, man? Uh, pretty well. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, I've been sick on and off all summer, and finally feeling better. I think, and getting back to brewing more. It's great. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. I was in you the new Mars Brewery. Was it last week? I think it was last week. And uh, for the first time in in a while, I think it was the first time since you guys had started brewing there. I saw it when the equipment was in, but it wasn't being used yet. And they were in there brewing. Um, We kind of came unannounced. Uh, Ed kind of showed us in, and um, you and Eric were there. And what song was blasting on the radio? Boogie Wonderland. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to guess Afternoon Delight. but Well, I mean, they were making the boogie, and it was the Boogie Wonderland playing, and part of me was curious if that was just what they always listened to while making boogie as you kind of like sing to plants or something like that. (sighs) That was a random playlist, I promise. Or was it just they saw me coming and said, oh, that's that's quick. Like, yeah. I wish we could do that. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Anyway, it was perfect. (laughs) You You got a kick out of it. Oh, I loved it. Um so uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on, man. It's great to be here. Yeah, so let's uh, just keep it keep it rolling um, and get right into beers that we've been enjoying lately or that we're excited to enjoy. Anything out there, guys? It's a regular segment, so hopefully I'm not taking you by surprise. 
Josh, uh, you're I, usually a one who's prepared. Yeah, I've, I've got too many things I want to say. Well, one is I'm going to be honest. This is uh, I was skeptical of this black Berliner Weiss with cherries from from you, sir. But damn good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm always, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. Whenever you see two words go together that don't make a lot of sense, like black and Berliner Weiss, we it's weren't like, sure what to call it. Oh, so. I don't know about that. But no. That's, and which beer are you great. talking about? Uh, this is Mars, and the name is incredible. Bubbly. Creek with the K. K R I E K. So it's a <laughs> the, the Chicago reference and a Creek reference. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Um, can I also can I say two other things real super quick? Yeah. Uh, just Zwickle. I just love Zwickle. Mm-hmm. Just it's just my favorite beer stuff right fails. now. Um, and uh, anyone in particular? Uh, Metro now has their Zwickle. They make it year round now that Heliostat. they have a tap room. Yep, Heliostat <laughs> now is a year round beer, and it's now on tap always at. Metro, which is pretty wonderful. Yeah, I was just at that location a few days ago, too. Looks Beautiful. good, doesn't it? Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, and what was the other thing I was going to say? <clears throat> oh, yeah. So, well, I guess we're going to probably talk. Are we going to talk about GABF Awards later? Um, Sure, but you can, I mean, do you want to save gonna, it? So, yeah, well, I'll save it. I'll save it. Okay, cool. Uh, so Zwickle and uh, Black Berliner Weiss with Cherries called Bubbly Creek from Mars. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad to see that one in, in cans. That beer is that beer's pretty good. So well done, well done, Tim and 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 everyone else. And it's four percent. I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, what the cherry well, version of your be, Bubbly no. Creek C R E E K. Yeah, with just a little bit of roasted malt, a little bit of roast barley. Just okay, give it a little color, a little chocolate to go with those cherries. Mm-hmm. Really, uh, and actually the yeast uh, that we use, the mixed culture that's in there, uh, already creates some cherry flavors on its own. Just mixed with those roast malts, it's kind of cool. Uh, so we just emphasize that a little more with the. So did you really go into this not knowing if this if it was going to work or not, or did you feel pretty confident? Um, no, we just wanted to do our kind of fast creek. You know, it was just what we could do at the facility that we had in this you know tiny apartment. We didn't have barrels and things, um, so that was just a way for us to kind of try and emulate some of those flavors and get something out of a tank in a month instead of waiting in barrels forever. When but, he, uh, yeah, we just accidentally discovered that don't the tell yeast worked that roasted stuff. Yeah. <laughs> They're coming for you. Uh-huh. We'll get into that later, I'm sure. <laughs> when are you going to be uh, canning your, what was it, the the project number one? Or what was that um, that beer that you put out? It had a purple and red label. It was the absinthe and wine barrel oh, aged brew it. You know, that might be one of those one offs that packs. you can just never repeat. Twelve pack cans. Yeah, I wish. Um, that was a happy, happy coincidence. Or not coincidence, but very fortunate blend. Yeah. What yeah. Um, what, what was the, the beer? And it was an absinthe barrel. It was basically a a multi gruit, a darker, multi or heavier gruit. Um one absinthe barrel, one wine barrel blended together, elderberries, fresh rosemary, cinnamon sticks, all kinds of stuff. It just was incredible. Smelled different than it tasted. It was just yep. a wild, wild beer. Yeah, we, I think, almost didn't bring any of it in, and then we brought in one case, and then we had it, and I th- and immediately tried to get as much as we possibly <laughs> could, and it might have been, like, there was, like, none of that, man. You you missed your opportunity. Yeah, we made, like, 30 cases of that or something. Yeah. yeah. That was a great beer, though. Cool. And what was it called? I'm sorry. Uh, that was potion number one. Potion number so one. So we're actually, next week, we're about to do potion number two, which is going to be a totally different beer, totally different adjuncts. Uh, same thing, no hops, um, trying to go back to the old world kind of brewing. Cool. So uh, now we've got more barrel capacity, and we can play around and let stuff sit. Nice. Um, and Kate, anything that you've had lately that's exciting? Um, and because I just did have it, but, <laughs> I mean, it's right here. But um, the... Uh, also from Tim and from Mars, the their Northeast IPA. It's like a really good hazy version of this. I I like it. It doesn't have that like back throat grassy bite that I kind of can't really dig. Um, lots of like papaya notes. It's very juicy. It's really good. I'm um, blushing, guys. Come on. It's just the easy answer, Tim. It's yeah, like yeah, right, yeah. Here. It's right here. Yeah. Uh, we just didn't come prepared. But also, um, someone <laughs> so brought a bunch of <laughs> someone brought a bunch of beers. It uh, wouldn't have been my choice <laughs> had I come prepared. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> someone did bring a bunch of beers uh, from Burial by the Brewery by Pipeworks recently, and everything was like really, really delicious. And I know it's a brewery that has a lot of hype behind it, and sometimes. When you finally get a chance to actually try some of those beers, you can be like, "Really? I don't know." But uh, the, I was, everyone was just like, "Yeah, it's really balanced." Which very brewery? Good. Uh, from Burial Brewery. Where are they? I actually don't. I, I think North Carolina. I'm sure. I want to say people, Asheville. Uh, yeah, that's so. Are they the new cool Asheville brewery now that 
they're one of the cool ones. Well, now that you yeah. know, you know who did you know what? <laughs> yeah, wicked <Shh>. weed. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about it. No, we don't. yes, we do. We talk about it. They, to no which, end. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, cool. And for me, a beer that I had. Um, well, okay. So I guess this isn't a beer that it's all right. So we had a, a, a little bottle share at the bar the other day. Um, Fitz, you know, friend of the show, frequent guest Fitz asked if I wanted to have a bottle share. I said, sure. And just kind of dug into just some of the beers that I had at the store that were, um, mine and just like coated in dust i just reached for some of the dustiest stuff i had and i got a 2009 three philosophers from omegang which i remember when i started you know buying that beer it was known as one of the best aging beers yada yada it was a 2009 tasted like garbage so no good it just it the cherries 2009 oh yeah Yeah. i mean is there any beer that's really worth yeah, I mean some I barley mean, wines and some maybe yeah, like expedition. I've had some lambic you know, that held yeah. up really yeah. well. Yeah, that's but, true. Some of those sours. Is this a new segment where we diss beers? <laughs> that would actually be yeah. very welcome some, at this point. <laughs> yeah. What are some beers you've been drinking that you're? Burial <laughs> is is in Asheville, by the way. Yeah, and the Cubs are are now down four to two. So oh. hey, oh, there you go. Yeah, uh, a little ray of hope. They've doubled their production. That's right. Hmm. Um, but for a beer that I had that I really liked is we oh, had. Now it's four to three. There you oh, are. Oh, boy. Good, good. There you go. This will be awesome <laughs> tomorrow when it comes out and everyone. Yeah, like, anyone on the <laughs> podcast <laughs> is like, dude, you already know the Cubs won nine to five. Give it up. But now we're in real time here. Uh, so you're saying they're they're going to let up another run, too. Uh, yeah, but they're going to score yeah nine yeah. so it's all fine everything's okay. good nine to five i'm calling the final right go. now yeah. Whew, i feel so much better okay good good i'm glad you do um for me i had i've been having some uh wet hop beers and i had surly wet today that beer was excellent so it was nice to have one of those uh kind of classic wet hop beers that's been around for a while I really dug that. And then I had uh, Checkvar the other day, too, Checkvar Pills, and it was it was excellent. It had no diacetyl in it, which was uh, very welcome and uh, just a, a really solid beer. So, Were there fewer wet hop beers this year out? I think uh, we got – you know what? There might have been. I mean, it's for just, a couple of years, there were a ton to me right of now. them. Yeah, I feel like I, there, there were far fewer this year. But I, that's completely just off the top of my head. I mean, there were certainly some, but I don't know. I don't know how how many. You know, what was another beer that I had that was delicious was the Galaxy Unicorn from Pipeworks. Yeah. Ah, that beer, it's a good hop. Yeah, yeah. That was. I think that's that's my like favorite. the best uh, showcase of that hop. <clears throat> that was that's really excellent. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's one of those beers where you kind of just like try not to do too much to mm-hmm. it and have like just a really nice amount of sugar or, you know residual sugar and kind of let the hop do its thing don't try to hide it mm-hmm. so do i get to pick a beer oh you didn't do one? Oh yeah oh we were just all it you can't know, be yours it can't great. be mars that's the rule <laughs> uh yeah. Artie from second shift uh-huh. who's named after his uh newborn son recently and it's just a nice it's like a i think it's five percent or so just a nice golden ale brett golden ale kind of thing um sort of Katie-esque, but just a really pleasant, perfect little sourness, tartness, really. Um, super drinkable. When beer. did you have that? Um, he came by. We did a little uh, collab a couple weeks ago and brought a couple bottles of that and oh, cool. really enjoyed yeah. it. Nice. Someone at a store that is not Beer Temple recommended anything by Second Shift to me yesterday, so I guess oh. they've got a little bit of hmm. little bit of juice going on. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, they just came up here, um, started distributing in Chicago. Cool. They it's nice to yet. have their stuff up here. I'm yep. excited to try the collab, yeah. They're, yeah, Someday. great. That's exciting. Uh, why don't we – can we take a, a quick break, John, and, and run some promos, let you know some of the other stuff that's going on on Lumpin' Radio, and then we will return shortly with more of the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Look at that. Listen, the sound of papers getting prepared as I actually may know what I'm talking about for once. Nah, it's probably the sound not. of me shuffling my iPhone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, welcome back to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable again with the the nice smirk. Um, 
I am your host, Chris Quinn, and I am joined by my guests, Josh Noel, Kate Branken, and Tim Lang. And we're sitting in here watching uh, the festivities happen in Studio A and uh, enjoying some uh, some beers that I've never I've never had the beer that you guys are pouring out. What, what beer is that? Flume? Battery from? Steel Brewing. Flume Double IPA. Nice. I'd like to uh, mm, try a little bit from of that. Portland Me. Oh, Portland Me. Great city. Thanks. You were just there, right, Kate? I was. I'm Did you go to... Flume or what's no, I didn't. I um, I was only there for like twenty four hours, but um, I went to Allagash pretty much as soon as I got off the plane, uh, and, and did the tour there. And worth it, right? It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, the just, I mean, that's a brewery that I've kind of been like you know geeking out on before ever getting involved in beer in any capacity, and so to actually be there was incredible. Um. Yeah, it is kind of cool to to go there and just see, like, wow, this is where all the Allagash White comes from. Yeah. Um, It's a great facility, very clean. I couldn't get over their floors. Excellent floors. Um, And very bright. Very bright tile. Very, Mm -hmm. like, spotless, the whole place. Um, And they were like, hey, you want to, you know, I asked some probably annoying and like kind of nerdy question and they were like oh do you work in the beer industry and i was like yes i do sure do. (laughs) and then they were like do you want to see the cool ship and i was like i do uh so that was really cool um did you lay down in it or what no i didn't i gotta go back did you tell them that you were on a a major contributing factor to the best local uh beer writing in the galaxy i didn't have to i had a name tag i had a name tag where all that information was very prominently qr code (laughs) okay (laughs) Good. Yeah. Following I don't know. You tell factory. me if I am. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Katronica. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, and then also a friend of mine, uh, Joe Watts, who was at Folksbeer in New York, um, ended up, now he works at um, Oxbow in their barrel and blending facility. Oh, awesome. So he showed me around that place. We drank some beers. Everything there is incredible. Um, so I brought you know another one but yeah portland maine is there's a lot going on um, in a little amount of space yes yeah. and it's there's one bakery there i'm sure so i wish i could remember it but like everything was just like everything i had on that tr- short 24 hours was just really delicious that's cool i've never been to the blending facility of oxbow i've been up to their their brewery but um I mean, those guys place. are awesome and yeah. you brought a beer so I thank did. you yeah. liquid swords i've never had that one they have a lot of Wu Tang references apparently in their beers, they which do, I think is kind yeah. of neat. They like so, hip hop. Yes, looking forward to that. And you've told me in the past that you would like to see more hip hop inspired or somehow related beers. Doesn't Kate? I, that, did I say that? <laughs> you did. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> what time of night was that? That's an awful idea. How many? <laughs> yeah, I'm not so surprised by that. Yeah. Um, well, I like hip hop, so sure. Yeah, I think you had said that heavy metal seems to have a um, monopoly on mm-hmm. the kind of the beer inspired things, or at least the themes, yes. the look, you mm-hmm. know, stuff like that. Yeah, there's a, a trend that I I just think, you know, more more anything, whatever anybody wants to do. Yeah. More sensitive indie rock. Yes. Mm-hmm. More emo more inspired beers. Oh, God, no, not, not emo. I'm thinking more like Smith's. Oh, well, I mean, you, you're you're lucky Ed's not around because he would come down and be like, actually, we're coming out with a 12-part series on the Smiths, <laughs> followed by another Including one on Morrissey. Rye. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. um, I like Ed even more now. If I didn't know that that was possible. Oh, I mean, I, I would imagine there are multiple beer names inspired by Morrissey or the Smiths, I would think. Mm-hmm. Right? I think we only have one. Just one? I think. It's Miserable Rye? Yeah. Okay. Oh, not, not the best that's, name. No, that's a great that's name. Good. That's yeah, really good for the few of you that understand it. Uh, girlfriend in. Uh, you can think while yeah, I move think, on to the next I'll topic. Yeah. Um, so why don't we just get right into GABF? I was going to do the the you know most significant craft beer thing. Does anyone really want to strongly weigh in on that? We've been doing it for the past couple most weeks. Most significant. All right, forget it. Uh, <laughs> GABF happened. Is it most significant beer? Craft beer. Craft beer? To come out in the last 25 years. Oh, that's easy to me. Bourbon County? Yeah. yeah I was I actually figured. thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I think it probably would be too. That's why it's the title of my book. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it is. I mean, it's like there are a few other beers that 
and someone out there in West Coast IPA, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, Pliny's been a, ma- a big one. Lagunese IPA has been one that people too hard about. Like, the whole like IPA thing has become so, uh, I was actually going to say hazy, but I don't mean it in that way. <laughs> I mean, but it, it has. Like, really. There's, this, there's yeah. so many of them, and like the tree just has so many roots. Whereas, you know, pretty much everyone makes a, a bourbon barrel age or whiskey barrel age stout now, and it all funnels back to one place. So that's why I think it's Bourbon County stuff, pretty much hands down. Because you can you can dial it into a single pl- a single beer. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, and when was that beer first bottled? Uh, bottled is different than than released. For, it was when first, was it first released? 1995. Thanks for asking. 95. Okay. Yep, it, and it said 92 on the labels for about 15 years. Do you know why it said <clears> that? <throat> yes, I do because. Uh, Greg but you'll Hall. have to read the book to find yeah. out. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, that's not really in there. That ended up being just something I wrote for the Tribune as a result of doing research on the book. Um, but Greg just Greg Hall, who is uh, the brewmaster for 20 years, uh, just sort of shot from the hip when it came time to decide how old Bourbon <laughs> County was. He's a big believer. I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant marketer. And he knows the value of an origin story, and an origin story needs a date. And so he just sort of triangulated to 1992. But when I sort of dug into the facts, which I needed to do for the book, it was very obvious that it was 1995. So okay. it was first released in 1995. And it how was, was it obvious? Like, what, what did you find that, was, that made it obvious to you? Well, the part of the origin story is this, this fateful dinner he had with Booker No, who was the master distiller at Jim Beam. And I knew where the— where He the, wasn't born until 1993. Aha! Yeah. No, no he, Booker No was probably no, born about 1926. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the I dinner, knew yeah. where the dinner was. It was at a restaurant in uh, South Bend, Indiana, and I called up the owner of that restaurant and said, hey, this dinner happened at some point in the 90s. When do you think it was? And he was able to – it took him a few days to figure it out, but he sort of combed through his records and photos and wow. memorabilia, and he was able to pinpoint it to October – I think it was October 5th, 1994. Okay. Uh, and he and I said, is there any... Yeah, I heard, yeah we all heard that. That's, yeah. that's scary. <laughs> Studio A. Spooky. People. Um, he, was, uh, he was 100% confident that it was October 5th, 1994. Uh, and it, then when you sort of s- stitch things together, such as it would have taken a while... Then, so that night, Greg Hall asked Booker No for the barrels that would eventually uh, hold the very first incarnation of Bourbon County Stout. If you factor in that it took a little while for those barrels to arrive in Chicago from Louisville or, you know, wherever the distillery was in Kentucky, um, and that the beer sat in there for three months. Right. And that it was entered in the first appearance at GABF was 1995. It all just sort of boop, tied together perfectly. And then Greg's assistant brewer from that era reached out to me after I wrote a story about it and said it was 100% 1995. I'm positive of it. It was a guy named, uh, I want to say is, is uh, Percy, and he lives in San Francisco now. And so I interviewed him, and he said I was at Goose for this time and this time, and I'm, I've, for all these years I've looked at that label that says since 1992 and known that that was not true. It was absolutely 1995. So that was sort of the last, huh. the last brick in the wall. Um, but it first went into bottles, and uh, that I can't remember off the top of my head. It was 04, I want to say, or 05, mm-hmm. one of those two. And it's probably been getting poured at GABF ever since 1995, I would imagine. Probably Until this year. Nice oh. segue, Chris Quinn. <laughs> you set me up. I just knock him down. Lay up. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, it was not uh, – so, that was one of the stories from GABF this year. Um, there was a, kind of a couple things that, that were going on, I think – you know, people are becoming more and more cynical. So a lot of the coverage I saw, or a lot of what I heard people talking about this year, was kind of um, that they felt that the, uh, you know, the, the not the awards, but the, well, some some of the awards, but also the the festival itself is just um, kind of this unruly blob of a thing. Has anyone here been to GABF? I have not. None of us have. Nope. Perfect. Uh, Let's talk about it. I've been a couple times. (laughs) Oh, okay. So I can speak to the fact that it is an unruly blob. It's just, it's huge. And the the Brewers Association, in a way, is in a no-win situation. Because you're, you know, when it started, there were, what, uh, it started in like, uh, I want to say the early 80s. 
when there were, Mm -hmm. you know, a couple hundred breweries, less than that in the country, and now there's more than 6,000, and how do you reflect that in one festival? That's a no-win situation. Do you have to? Does it have to be complete? Well, maybe that's the question. Do you have to? I mean, is is there a way to do it more intimately? It's... um, it's it's so big, and I'm there. So there's four sessions, and I've been twice as media, never just as a paying customer. Which honestly, I'm not sure I would do that because it's it's. I, I go to three of the four sessions as media, and it's I've still left seventy percent of what I want to do on the table. Mm-hmm. It's just there's it's just, it's impossible to wrap your arms around it. I'm curious why. So Pipeworks is an awesome brewery with a lot of buzz. Have you you guys have never poured there? Um, no, we never have. Um, and that, that was one of the gripes that someone had, and there was a lot of sort of post-GABF uh, griping, I feel like, this year. And now mm-hmm. that, you know, that's sort of the thing to do in, in the beer industry. Yep. And one of one of the gripes was that a lot of the, the most exciting breweries that people are really interested in uh, aren't there. And I would say Pipeworks is definitely one of those exciting breweries with buzz nationally. And so I was wondering, why, why is it not something that you guys do? Um... Well, uh, well, we uh, just can't remember the date to submit. Uh, <laughs> that I'm no, uh, we you know we don't really brew to style. We don't really um, do that. So that was never like a factor to compete. Um, it but wasn't really something that. What were you saying? Tim? Well, I was going to say it turns out it doesn't seem to really matter though. Exactly. Um, Even though they do have this criteria, like for example, I saw a session IPA oh, right. that was five point eight percent won a medal. Yeah. So they're not eliminating beers that don't fit the styles, but yet you have to submit to these styles. So it's... What, it, yeah. what is it even... It's amorphous. And then what does yeah. it even mean? And then like yeah. what... Um, That's true. I mean, that in that instance... Sorry to interrupt you, Kate. No. I, I mean, it, but it is funny, like session IPA, but then not being a session IPA, we well, are going to have a leg up on people because someone who's drinking it blind is going to be like, wow, there's like the body here is great. You and I f- way more overhead to bitter. You yeah. Know, all that stuff. Also, I mean, session IPA is kind of like a funny one anyways, because like the category itself is sort of like a new thing that kind of came out of a reactionary, a reaction to other IPAs. And it was almost like a sort of like a marketing thing. And like, is that really a style? Like, I don't know. Um, so to have it then defined almost after it's already been defined by brewers and then to have it def- like a post definition uh, that's supposed to be sort of encompassing of what's already been happening instead of to try to explain what brewers have been doing instead of having a definition that then people brew to, I think is kind of what's been going on in that category. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Have you guys ever talked about, I mean, even if you don't compete, just going out there to pour? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. It's uh something that we would do it's just not something we have done um we do always compete in more local not com- i mean we participate in more local fests um i mean that's what seems to make the most sense for us i'm sure there'll be a time when we'll we'll do it but um yeah just have not have not done it. there hasn't been a huge driving interest from anyone and i think that's maybe what the uh, you're i believe referring to the article from the full pint yes josh yep. that you had sent around to all of us beforehand yep um and the, yeah they had a couple of things that they didn't like about the the gabf um and one was that it was was too large they said there was you know too many categories which i think you had made a note about um yeah. tim that you said <laughs> that the styles and judging are a mess, and then I heard another article where someone said if they could reform one thing, it would be the judging process because it's just antiquated or something like that. I'm not quite sure I understand how it is or how it could be done better. Um, but the other thing that the full point was talking about was they <clears throat> were hoping to pr- promote hot breweries or breweries that have a lot of hype and stuff like that and get people kind of interested there. And they talked about you know some of these breweries that you know someone like a, a Pipeworks. You know, would fit into. I think they used Monkish and Trillium, Trillium or yeah. something like that. The problem with that, from the consumer standpoint, and that sounds great in theory now, but when you're standing in that massive, loud, echoing hall, uh, yeah. Juan s- Kim is making fun of how hot it is in here, and it is. It's so really warm. well it's very it's toasty. and I have nothing on but a except for two shirts, oh. as you always do. <laughs> yeah, but one of them is a V-neck undershirt, and I don't know if I can. Pull that off here, with uh, especially with Studio Help A us. watching. Please Help. yes, please yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, is like if they're 
the only good thing about Trillium being at GABF from my personal vantage would be that that's fewer people I need to compete against to get all the other beer I want because that line would be obnoxious. I'm not going to stand in that line. So all that Trillium is going to really equate to is an obnoxious line. But maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. And and that, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, you can you can definitely have arguments, too, about what is it about. Is it about being able to find breweries that are small regional breweries that you don't have access to well, or that, hype breweries or maybe, yeah. My you know. favorite thing about it is is just sort of stumbling on small, like finding great beers from little breweries that you've mm-hmm. never heard yeah, of absolutely. in far off mm-hmm. places you would never try otherwise. And you're going to taste a lot of kind of eh beer, but you're also going to find some real gems. And that that's the fun part to me. I'm looking at the GABF style guidelines right now. And they, I was just wondering if maybe they somehow didn't define session IPA by ABV exactly, but it says uh, additional notes, beers exceeding five. Yeah, no, it is. But uh, beers exceeding 5% ABV are not considered session IPAs. So the fact that they let it 5.8%, if that's accurate, I never fact checked that. I just saw it online. Uh, that's, that's a, oops. That's not cool. Yeah. And I'm sure they realize that. It's just another frustrating aspect of competitions, which is supposed to be a key factor of this event. And if it's something that we are all supposed to brew to and adhere to, if if they're going to give medals to things that don't follow the limited criteria they have. And I think think Brian Roth had a a post on his blog about something similar about just different different. Uh, breweries and and or different styles and the growth of different styles and I think you were talking about about that a little bit too, Tim. But one of the things that he mentioned was uh, you know how coffee beers have kind of exploded lately. There, you know, they've gone up you know over a hundred percent in just like three or four years. And he also uh, he also mentioned how you know of the they broke out the coffee beer categories to coffee beer and coffee stout and porter Mm -hmm. but like milk stouts still won the coffee beer medals or like a couple of them and it's just kind of what you're saying just a mess yeah it's definitely (laughs) hard there's multiple saisons which we could talk about (laughs) for a while but there's just and then the ipa now is clearly this hazy thing is in my opinion the new ipa trend Uh, And I don't see it going away. I think that's what a lot of people prefer and want to drink these days. Uh, So that style is sort of not represented. Uh, It doesn't fall within the sort of West Coast typical judging IPA. I think there's certain styles of beer that really do lend themselves to competition. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that Pivo Pills has won as many awards as it has. It's a very clean, excellently executed beer. You know, that, that is a surprise to me. I mean, really? I, it's amazing because there's so there's so many. I mean, t- speaking of, of breweries that or styles that have exploded, so German style pills is the most uh, has the highest growth since 2003, the 2013 to 2017. It's up like 160 percent, and. Pivo has won won the first three years it existed, and then it took a two-year break, and then it won again this year. It won a bronze. Um, And it's pretty hot forward. That's amazing. Yes, it is. I mean, it's funny that to style, it's it's way – I think it's dry hop. Which is another aspect of judging, too. You know, you've got a beer like that. If you've got a flight of beers in front of you, that thing is really going to stand out, Um, even if it's not to style. That beer is going to dominate a judge's palate, and it's going to make it harder for them to pick up the delicate attributes of other beers. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the game of judging or uh, yeah. of submitting and beers to that. It's talking, how do you play I mean, that? Talking about the flaws in all the categories is by no means to take away, at least from me, uh, the breweries that did win awards. And there were quite a few from Illinois, which is great. It's Congrats important. Everybody. I mean, it's a huge. Yep. I, I do think it is like a big deal to win one of those for so many reasons. Totally. Um, and on tour, one best small brewery mm-hmm. in the country. I mean, brand new, brand new brewery. So good, good awesome. on them. Yeah, and uh, the IPA category. Yeah, that that which I'm sure was that's one the, of the biggest. That's mind if not blowing. The biggest I think it category was, it was the biggest category in the history of the awards. Four hundred some. And hailstorm in there. And hailstorm little hailstorm from, hail from Tinley Park wins with Prairie Madness. And you had one today, and you said it was very good. It was quite good. Yeah, and that's it's. Uh, I'm not sure that a lot of the folks who have come on board the IPA train lately because of the hazy thing 
will be into it that much. Yeah, they make hazy, hazy. Uh, they do, and that's what they're known well. for, and yeah. that's what their brewmaster or head brewer slash owner likes. Is mm-hmm. he's like. He was. Sh- I I talked to him the day that he won, and he was stunned. He's like, "I like our hazy IPA better." <laughs> I just sort of entered this to enter it. Um, well, that's but telling it, too. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. I don't know. I think they're. I, I'm looking forward to the correction a little bit and people to get over the hazy thing. I mean, I, I like hazy to a degree, uh, but I like balance more than hazy. Yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. You got to hit that. You know, extreme. Some have. I mean, some, some are have, doing yeah. it really well. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I thought it was telling that you guys. Oh, I think we talked about this off the air. Uh, that your Pipeworks, quote unquote, hazy IPA was like not really that true to the style. But in a way, th- I mean that as a compliment. Like I liked it better than the beers that are like just trying to be true to the style. Okay. It's just sort of doing its own thing and had nice carbonation and yeah. stuff. And, you cool. know. So Thanks. here's something that's that's nuts about the. I mean, the number of categories is, I mean, there's almost 100 categories now. Mm-hmm. So they're giving out, based on, you know, 300 hmm. medals, unless, you know, no beer. Unless is, something's not good enough, which right. is another. Yeah. Did you, I can't remember. what That, was it, that like happens pretty much every fruited year. Fruited sour or something? Yeah. Like, nothing was good enough for a gold. Nothing was good enough. That's. Yeah. It's like, come on. <laughs> well. and, then, and I love that everyone always kind of boos. I think it's kind of, you know, if they're saying nothing is exempt. Blurry, you know, then they they don't award a gold and how many whatever. were in the category? Do you have it in front? That of you? one, I don't know. What I was going to say is that I was surprised that Kolsch was the eighth most popular style this year of ninety eight styles. Kolsch was was eighth, and and that's so uh, essentially, the, you know, the top five is all you know pale ale. So it's IPA, Imperial IPA, then coffee beer, which is insane that that jumped all the way up there. But then it's American Pale Ale and American S- Strong Pale Ale. So I mean, those four are just essentially IPAs, maybe you know variants of IPA. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm surprised there wasn't you know the Session IPA. Yeah, so it's a strong Black pale ale, IPA, a Session IPA. IPA? Yeah, or, yeah exactly. at that point, why can't they just throw in a hazy IPA category? Right? I think they will shortly, and they should. Yeah, I mean, it's w- legit. W- why not? And, uh, but then, you know, after that, then you have the wood beer. So wood, strong stout, wood, uh, aged, barrel aged, strong beer. Then Kolsch, hmm. uh, was, was next. And then herb and spice beer, which, you know, that could be a mil- that's such a wide category. So that could be everyone's pumpkin beer, anyone's Gruet, anyone's, you know, all this stuff can be an herb or, or spice beer. And then, uh, then German Pilsner, you know, is, is growing by leaps and bounds as well, which I think shows just the trend, the move towards, you know, other than other than these IPAs, you know, you've got these showcase beers that people want to showcase, which is the, the wood barrel age stuff. I mean, that's what people want to, you know, hang their hat on and be known for and win awards for. And, and you know, it's kind of the, the Goose Island model, you know, with BCS being their kind of, I don't know how you, it's not really a flagship, but it's, it's almost like a masthead or something. I don't know how you would call it. But but then after that, these, you know, German pale beers that are just, you know, true session beers. Um, so is that showing some uh, significant, like, industry fatigue on all these, the, the hop and alcohol wars and just all this? Like, does everybody just want to go back to these lighter beers now? Or are we all? Well, but you know, IPA is number one by leaps and bounds, right, in terms of? Yeah, IPA had 408 entries. Um, and then Imperial IPA had 220, and then 200 or 199 for APA, 182. But, you know, you've got German Kolsch with 154 and German-style Pilsner with 145. So they're starting to to creep up there. But, yeah, it's still – the Kings are still the, the IPAs. But, I mean, right after that, there's a lot of – other. I mean, there's, you know, 90 other styles out there. And, uh, I mean – uh, Kolsch really surprises me more so than than Pilsner personally. Doesn't that make sense though, especially in like the brew pub model, because you have to have something approachable. Yeah. So that that's kind of a beer that you can beer yeah. nerds can geek out on, and someone who's not a beer nerd can you can put it in their hand and that'll work. So, but I'm surprised it's not a golden ale in that instance because you can make it yeah I mean, faster that was, than a Kolsch. You're not lagering it like a Kolsch. 10, 15 think, years yeah, ago. Yeah, everybody's was, tired of the blonde. Yeah, and the, yeah. yeah. 
that's it's just a more interesting beer. I think it's you know generally got the apple, little acetaldehyde or whatever else, and just it's I think a little more appealing to some people. You know, cider drinkers, different things. That that's maybe sort of a nice encapsulation of how craft beer is here to stay and is really like, uh, you know, created the revolution in terms of like it's not the least common denominator, aka gold nail. It's Kolsch. You know, it's like things mm-hmm. have really truly changed and are not going back. So one of the things that the full pint suggested doing was cut the number of categories in half. Uh, just by having so many, it kind of dilutes in. It makes it messy and muddy and, and stuff like that. It's a great idea. Though you that's, th- I'm not sure yeah. how I feel about that. I you love think the idea, but it's cake? a lot less money in in the Brewers Association's coffers. Because you mean, pay for every entry. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I prob- the odds of that happening are probably nil. And well, isn't it – maybe it's good for the industry if, like, more – twice as many people are able to claim an award. Or know? breweries really select what they think are their strongest beers and charge them more for it. I don't know. So I'll if they that. were to to cut them in half, let's say, how would they do it? Would they do it by, like, meh, you know, Australian-style pale ale is not really a beer that's, you know, a thing here. You mean a sparkling ale? Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. I know you've made Oh, you one. made a good... That was good. I like that. <laughs> but... Thank you. You know, but my guess is some of the ones, time. they'd probably do it by what are the... Have the least number of entrants. And some of those might be like classic, you know, historical beers that just aren't any, judged anymore. Well, things at, change, right? They evolve. I know, but do we want to see the, the Great American Beer Fest Awards reflect... You know, one third of all the uh, uh, categories are then basically just hazy IPA. Yes, right, like <laughs> variants of IPA, so I can try to worm my way into a, a medal because I don't want to compete with four hundred other people for IPA. So I'll do Australian sparkling ale, and I'll win it all the time, like like you know, Sculpin did a couple times until people caught on and started going into that category. So I mean, I do think that there is a little bit of you know, gamesmanship here. You know, I'm sure. going to go into American strong pale ale. Whatever I mean, that. How is that thing. not an IPA? <laughs> how, I mean, ha- having not been there, um, like, what it is? Is it like all about the awards? Is that like the focal point of the event? I mean, it just seems kind of like for the industry an side. Yeah, I mean, it all comes. It's I think that's Saturday morning, and it's that's like the the thing. Yeah, that's the and thing. it is the thing that I think carries year round. So there's the festival, but then after that, it's the thing that people. Put on their yeah. bottles or put the, the medals up in their brew pubs mm-hmm. and stuff like that. The so. festival is the consumer-facing part and the awards is the, the industry part. It would be interesting to see a festival where there's only a select number of categories and then just all brewers can, you know, it, like very specific parameters. And then brewers brew to those parameters, I guess, to see. I mean, I guess that's what it already is. Never mind. Just well, think it out loud. No, but what, <laughs> what Chris said about uh, what was it? American well, strong pale ale. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I American mean, style curious. strong pale ale. So yes, probably you can either slot that in pale ale or IPA, mm-hmm. right? So that that might be a category that can go. Right. I think there's um, definitions that need to be hardened within those categories. I think that would help. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. but I think it is fun. I mean, awards are fun. fun. It is nice to. It is nice to be recognized or to even just learn about breweries. I mean, sometimes what I've noticed lately Absolutely. is last two years, uh, there will be entire categories where I have not heard of a single brewery. And that did not happen five years ago. Well, that's what happens when there's 6,000 breweries, right? Right. We're like, I. there's been three awards in a row now. I haven't heard of a single brewery. But... Um, yeah, it's it's wild. the The breakout is still by state is hasn't changed much, with one exception. So California and Colorado always dominate. Uh, California, uh, those two uh, states combined took like a third of all the medals. <laughs> um, and after that, though, the third was Texas. I wonder if if California and Colorado crazy. are overrepresented in entering, though. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because again, in this this is. My favorite stuff that Brian Roth does is when he kind of gets into the the oh, numbers. When of Brian stuff. Roth nerds out, it's good news for all of us. <laughs> yeah. So this was uh, he picked up a, a a tweet from Carla Water, the at Beer Babe on Twitter, 
and she had a, a graphic of what percentage of each state's total breweries were pouring at GABF. And it was like 48% for Colorado. Um, Which makes sense because they don't have far to go. Right. Yeah. Uh, 24% for California. I mean, but it's, it's but pouring there and entering are two different things into the competition. Sure, sure, yes. There uh, may be a correlation. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not trying to drag you down right now. I'm just that's saying fine. they they could be two different things. Cut the infographic. Don't stop. I'm <laughs> just, you're, you're right. You're right. But it's it's something. Don't it's, question the infographic. <laughs> no, no, no. It has no. info in the title. I know. And it's a graphic. We can see it. It's a picture. Except if you're listening to the radio, which you are. Don't. No, you yeah. should be watching the Cubs game. What's the score? Uh, I have a feeling you'll tell us. Who cares? I'm going to look right now. Yeah, no, I think Tim just gave us an update. No, baseball <laughs> rules. Baseball rules. <laughs> um, Boring. Yeah. We it's are on the south side. 4 yeah. 3 Nationals still. Top All right. Of the fifth inning. All right, there you go. They got another run. They've tripled. No, no, no. Their no it's still. Oh, oh. I didn't tell it's you that two. it was. No, it's well. Yeah, it's four. It's been four three for a little while now. Oh. And now let's go to weather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Forty two. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else uh, uh, that you guys wanted to talk about with the G A B? Can we just marinate one more minute on the fact that hailstorm from Tinley Park won gold and. IPA from among 408 beers. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's pretty awesome. Crazy. That's awesome. I mean, what do you even congrats make of them. that? I mean, yes, it's awesome and congrats and wonderful, but it's like, what is that? It's that's just it's mind blowing. It questions in a way. you know why people talk about certain breweries. Why do people drink certain breweries' beer? I mean, is it because we're all looking for the best, absolute best IPA, and that's what we're looking for, or is it because there's other things at play that make you want to, you know? look and seek out and hype up or whatever yada yada yeah. yada and to your point chris with all yeah. these unknowns it's good to see that things aren't the judges aren't able to pick up on their favorite beers maybe yeah as much as people assumed that they possibly were in the past um with all these new breweries and hailstorm and everything else it's i think it's good to see that things are getting mixed up in the in the judging yeah and they are a great brewery and that's like the best part of jbf mm-hmm. is being like reminded of oh yeah like we're so lucky to have such a wealth of breweries in chicago land um, that we can now like revisit them and be like, yeah. You know. I mean, I think on tour winning small yeah. brewery of the year is equally. Yeah, didn't they amazing. just open like months ago? They yeah, they opened in January. Opened. That's incredible. They Their beers are good. Opened. Yeah, I've been they by are good. There. They're good. Yeah, and they they won medals in two of the more obscure categories, um, with fewer entries. Okay, not to. I think like, that's totally how small brewery of them, the year but. works. It's like. Entrance number of entrants that you put in that placed or meddled and you know I think that I, it works. There's some sort of formulation, I believe. In, Does it fact? I don't think that. it factors into the number of entrants in the category you win, though. No, how difficult it is to win your category. No. Yeah, and they they won not and not to like rain on their parade, but I think they won in two of the less competitive categories. That said, they have an IPA that I think is. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's fantastic, and it's, I mean, I could see, could have seen that winning, didn't, mm-hmm. but, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're doing some good work, too. And, and so what, I'm curious, <clears throat> excuse me, you as the, the owner of a beer store, so what's your reaction mm, to the fact question. that On Tour is very small brewery of the year, and even more relevantly, is that a word? Relevantly? Sure. I think so. Even more relevant. I think you're the writer. Uh, I think it's a uh, word, but I don't know if it was used properly. Huh. Even more relevantly or even more relevant. That's irrelevant, Chris. True. Oh, move on. <laughs> Snap. Uh, anyhow, uh, what is, is the, the owner of, a, of a, a beer <laughs> store and bar, what, what's your reaction to Hailstorm winning this IPA award? Does, do you have more interest in stocking them or tapping them now? Absolutely. I, I want to give it a shot. I think people are interested in trying it and see what it's all about. I don't think it's going to be – so, you know, it, this has happened a couple of years ago when I think it was Hayoka at the time mm-hmm. won uh, the same thing for for Half Acre, won mm-hmm. IPA gold. Um, so that uh, that beer definitely saw a a spike and it was kind of a selling point. And then it's, it's you know, settled off, but but that beer is, is excellent. And 
uh, Half Acre has a pretty prominent name and brand here in Chicago, much more so than Hailstorm does. The geeks kind of go after Hailstorm, but mainly the the hazy stuff. I think I was telling you that we don't bring in nearly as much um, prairie prairie madness yep, yeah yep. as as we do like cirrus and some of their other haze haze bro beers and uh you know it's because they the, the sales don't warrant it yeah. so it's not that people are having this beer and saying whoa i need uh-huh. to have this beer again it's oh yeah i had you know prairie madness and cirrus and i'm going to pick up more cirrus so i think a lot of people think how the head brewer thinks and they like their hazy beers more yeah that's kind of what they're known for in our shop they're known for their well now they should be known for a beers. really beautiful balanced ipa next and time you're on why don't you will follow up and i'll see if if sales have had a kind of sustained mm-hmm. elevation because of this win if people are asking that's about it more you know a couple months down the road if it if it actually has traction and I'll try to see if it if uh, it's much harder to equate this to a, a win in an IPA category. Oh, yeah. Is uh, <laughs> I like the Kool Aid Man a little yeah. <laughs> vocalization as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll see. So if you remind me, I'll, uh, I'll I will let you know. I think it's probably about time for me to mention that you're listening to 105.5 <laughs> FM Chicago WLPN Bumpin' Radio, and I also think it's probably about time that we take a little bit of a musical excursion for about 10 minutes or so. And then we'll be back talking more beer with my guests, Kate Branken, Josh Noel, and Tim Lang on the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Welcome back to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Quinn, and I am joined by at least one very, very happy guest, Mr. Josh Noel. What happened? I just checked. No. Not hello, nice. hello, hello. This is important. I just checked the score. Yeah. Seven four Cubs. We were down four one. We're up seven four. I said the final was going to be nine to five. Whatever. This is this is good stuff. There you are. I took your tip, put a bunch of money on it, so I'm happy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go. Tim is anti baseball. Kate, how do you feel about baseball? Uh, agnostic. Agnostic. <laughs> that doesn't bad. sound. Garrett's a fan, right? Yeah. I probably yeah. Yeah. I've seen some sure. Facebook Why not? Yeah, no, from, there's a lot of people. Wrigley. A lot of people at Pipeworks who are. Yeah, seven four. Well, nice. I'm, I'm glad for you. Thank you. Yeah, I am also joined by Kate Branken and Tim Lang, and uh, I want to give a little shout out to um, to uh, I don't know uh, Pappy Strong. I guess I will call him Doug Doug Shalau for the uh, shout out. I know he's listening out there in Connecticut. So uh, sent hey, me a little, Shaw. yeah, he uh, he wanted me to give my regards to you specifically, ah, Kate. So there you go. Tell him I said, what's up, what's up, what's up? I think he's listening to you oh, say I that. I guess I can say that. What's yeah. up, what's up, what's up? So here's a little experiment. We have a, a can. We're looking through some of the beers that we have here. We I have a cooler that I, I bring in, and we just kind of throw beers into. One thing I've noticed is the can to bottle ratio has more than flipped. So it used to be mainly bottles and i'd have a couple cans and this show is only a couple years old now it is almost exclusively cans every week that that i bring in and i don't pick cans for any specific reason it's just how it's going it's it's crazy the the second is so there's a a beer that i just pulled out that none of us have uh, had or heard of has anyone here heard of modest brewing company's dream yard american ipa have no, not. so it's a sixteen ounce can, uh, uh, sticker label. Looks good. Yeah, label nice. Good. Yeah, nice, nice uh, label to it. Um, and I just saw the answer to what I was going to ask. I was, I, I said, what's the, what are the odds that this is going to be a hazy IPA? I mean, the label, the main label does not say. It just says Dream Yard American IPA. Looks like said, a shoegaze album, right? Mm, so I said, we'll open it up tip. and and see. I pegged it at eighty five percent. And there's your answer. Boom! And it is 100%. Yeah. That is. But now the question is, how is it? Let's review this thing in real time, and let's not pull any punches, shall we? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I was, it's funny. I was talking to somebody about how – I was talking to um, uh, Jonathan Fritz of uh, Hopewell Brewing, who is nice uh, man. a frequent nice man. guest on the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
he was talking about how Andy Crouch, the beer scribe, who blew us off uh, for this show, but was on a couple weeks ago here in person, you know, he wanted to talk about what beers sucked in, in Chicago. He specifically wanted to know, you're, you're talking about what beers Jonathan are great. Did? I love that. No, That's, no, not Jonathan. Oh, no, no, oh, Andy, Andy Crouch. And he was like, yeah, yeah man. Show. That was, uh, yeah. So, and I said, yeah, it's the beer writers. Because I said, um, I said, Josh Noel does the exact same thing. It's Andy <laughs> Crouch and Josh. They want to, like, get it's everyone on record slamming. They want to get those juicy quotes. <laughs> Uh, they're more interested in what's in what sucks. It, it well, not no, not almost, true. Yeah, no. I, <clears throat> we're interested right. in in like just as how I feel about my IPAs is how I feel about my beer discussion. Balance. I like balance. I don't just need to hear about what's good. Like let's let's talk about what's not so good and why. And so, you know what? A rising tide lifts all ships. So uh, Ooh, and that. go Cubs. Oh. I don't like that. The most well. famous beer writer <laughs> of our time, Michael Jackson was kind of famous for what he wouldn't say, and that's kind of how you knew if he didn't like a beer. He just wouldn't really talk about it or just very, like... Kind of brush over yeah, it. Yeah, just talk about it very maybe very briefly. That's in my book, actually. Okay. Yeah, that was actually a formative <laughs> moment for Greg Hall. Was uh, Can I tell the story super quick? Please. And uh, it was like <clears throat> 90... Would have been, I don't know, 92 or something, where Greg was just learning, or probably earlier, it was probably 90. Michael Jackson did a tasting in Chicago. And Greg went, and he was just sort of figuring out, you know, what, no, you're not feeling that? Um, I like the overhaze more. Is that fair to say? Which one's the overhaze? Thanks again. Yeah, that's the Morris one. Oh, I like yeah, the beer of the I guy who's in the you. room. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> flume was good. Yeah, yeah no. that was... The, I didn't care for the dank meme. All I had. I haven't had the dank that one. But I like I, the name. I I have had. I had the flume as well. But no, my there's favorite only just a little yeast in, left in the can. It is. It is really interesting to see brewers starting to play more with texture um, mm-hmm. in the liquid. I think that's like an important thing that's come out of the New England IPA. Is people experiencing that as sort of like another uh, dimension or another way, another th- item, or you know. I don't even know yeah. what's element a, element in <clears throat> what you consider. There's color, there's f- aroma, there's flavor, and now texture. Mouthfeel yeah. is way more of a prominent, uh, f- you know, factor when considering writing a recipe. I yeah. actually heard a man say at a hazy IPA tap takeover. It was all hazy IPAs, not one man. Brewery, but can't m- wait to multiple. go to one of them. And I heard a guy say, "This is a quote. I will never forget this. <laughs> I am a mouthfeel whore." Mm. (laughs) now wait this was just a a a normal a normal guy this is just a bro yeah talking about that's amazing (laughs) i am a mouthfeel whore Mm. and that's awesome that is i i wish did he have any favorites like i mean just imagine uh this is he was like a (laughs) hardcore bro i love that like he traded for the treehouse and the trillium so that's what he was into just can drop (laughs) sort of the the most the thing that really stuck with me though even more than that is we were talking we were talking about beer right oh we were talking about (laughs) beer and mouthfeel and Uh oh i see what you're saying uh no i was like and we were drinking the same beer and it was one of these hazy ipas and i was like doesn't that all that sweetness bother you at all and he was like, bro, it's not sweet. It's hoppy. Oh, and at are. that moment, I was like, you have no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I hope he doesn't listen but to the, the show. The, the, <laughs> but because, you know what, it it was an expression of the hops, as we were just yeah, discussing. But, and the, but, but it was incredibly sweet. And it's like, people, this is sort of part of my problem with hazy IPA, is it sort of short-circuited people's a, ability to sort of think critically about beer no way man people have been no. liking sweet and hoppy for yeah. a long time think they, about they some of these double day of pastry style right the, now i mean yeah. well that that's like that's my that's my but other double IPAs to grind been, right now have been get uh, a lot have been sweet for a long but the time fact a lot that of them this lot guy put lactose in it well you know? i think the lactose thing often personally doesn't work uh, but the fact that this guy was not able to discern the fact that this beer was intensely sweet and that it was quote unquote just hoppy. I mean, sweet and hoppy are those. You're just dis- you're using two different sure 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 versions of language to describe something. As right, br- but if you're gonna try to, uh, man, I mean, you can't. Uh, but but that's gonna be the that guy is probably way more knowledgeable than your average IPA. Anyone who says I'm an I, I am a mouthfeel whore <laughs> knows. 
that mouthfeel exists, even if he doesn't really know yeah, what it is. Yeah, that's important. That's like a telling. But if that's yeah. the, if he that's at least the, passed the Cicero server exam. <laughs> he at least looked See, up I would say a he beer wouldn't. advocate I mean, he, review he and saw what, aroma, yeah. appearance, yeah. mouthfeel, taste. Yeah, no finish. one's saying that about, like, you know, Bud Light in 1980. No. Oh, okay. Well, if we're going to, like, make that comparison, then absolutely, yes, yes. So I, baby a thousand steps. percent agree. But, yeah, no, he was obviously But I think that this is an example of it. Gentleman. It's, like, gone around the bend. Where it's like we've sort of lost the ability to talk and think about beer because now we're just mouthfeel whores. Mm. And things are not sweet. They're hoppy. Well, I mean, I think there's, there's, I mean, who knows? Maybe he heard that somewhere that he loves the mouthfeel and this and that and he's conflating things. But I do remember the first brewery where I really noticed texture of a beer was Hill Farmstead when I would have some of their saisons and, and some of their pale ales and they had this like mm-hmm. delicate mouthfeel mm-hmm. that you just I had never experienced before and um, so I do think that that has gotten you know incorporated into some of these New England style IPAs I, I don't know if I technically if I ever remembered that specifically with, with Hetty Topper and stuff like that but I mean, mouthfeel is definitely something with these. To me, honestly, it is the sweetness or perceived. It's really a, a lack of perceived bitterness that mm-hmm. I don't like. I've said it many times before. It can be sweet. That's fine. But I, I need it to be yeah, no, sweet is also good. just and as you bitter. Know what? Juicy is good. Like Juicy is delicious, but juicy needs to be balanced. Mm-hmm. And that's the fun of this style to brew this. It, it's kind of – it's been almost a relearning of some of the aspects of brewing, but – all these super late big hop additions it's a really fun way to showcase these new hops that have very complex uh aromas and flavors that if you throw them in earlier in the boil you just don't get um so what about as so we were sort of talking about this off air too you're a brewer tell me about like uh, showcasing those hops in a six percent Session you know, IPA. Well, yeah, like, I, well, session plus, you know, like something mm-hmm. with some body, it's something with some back. effervescence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or just, just like a nice pale ale, you know, like, why can't you showcase those hops in that format? You they can. Do, right? It's it's a different, these beers, um, there's a lot of things about them without going into too much of it, but, you know, there's there's a, a different water treatment, different salt additions, um, additional chloride to push the malt flavors. Uh, it gives you a different different ways to bitter and flavor the beer than you would with these normal kind of quote west coast normal style uh bitter beers and can you uh, combine some of the same elements can you do uh, um uh can you dry them out more can you and that's the uh, thing bitter some, them yes. like for example our beer um the overhaze people some people describe that as a dry finish it's actually a very sweet beer there's plenty of residual sweetness there but there's plenty of, or there's just enough. You have to get that bitterness with the hops just right so that you have that kind of background, I think, kind of going to the mouthfeel, bro. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you get that just right bitterness and feel to go with all those flavors and juiciness. Hey, can you give me a, a pour of the overhaze, please? Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, it, it's a really tricky thing. And then, of course, the beers change, you know, day to day, really, um, especially week to week. So it, it just, it, there's a lot to learn and play with and figure out, and it's been fun to just, see how they come out and figure out the dry hopping rates and figure out, you know, when do you put top pressure on it? Do you recirculate it? You know, there's all these different things that it's just not a normal IPA. And I have found that a lot of uh, brewers that I talk to do really like brewing these beers because it is such uncharted territory Oh yeah, that there's just, it's not, well, this is Absolutely. how you do this. It's not just paint by numbers. No. So it's probably a, a lot of fun for you guys. It too. is. And it's great. You know, it, it's it's like taking a film photo or something. You just you do it. You, it sits in the tank. You do these different things to it, and you just kind of see how it develops and plays out. And you know you might have an idea of what's going to happen. It's kind of like a sour beer in a way. It just this beer does it, not have it, a dry finish. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, <laughs> no, uh, but I hear you. But yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's, but it's not cloyingly sweet. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can but I it's just your... it's fun to to try these different hops and different combinations and different rates and just kind of see where it goes and how it lands and you know it's it's been fun. Cool. Um, so we were going to talk. And it'll yeah. be fascinating just to, s- to wrap it up. Yeah. Like, where is this going to be in five years and ten years? I don't I, think it's going it'll away. Be, well, it's, uh, I no, don't think it's, it's going not. away, but I think it's going to, like, settle in a place, I hope, I think, that will make sense. Whereas the, uh, the sure. you know, there's a lot of experimentation going on now, and hopefully that experiment, like, the bad experiments will be weeded out. 
the good experiments will be the standard in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm optimistic that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think it's also largely a reaction to brewers being exposed to new hop profiles that they haven't been before exposed to before. For example, Galaxy, we were mm-hmm. talking about that earlier. I mean, brewers are now brewing to different hop flavor aroma profiles than they hadn't ever been. So for, you know, for, you know, Galaxy double IPA, yes, there's residual sweetness because it's a hop that has like a juicy character to it, like lots of warming alcohol and uh, you kind of want it to still crisp out and dry out as m- even with that sweetness, it still isn't like overly done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I- and, but so I think that this is sort of a new hot profile brewers are kind of like really jumping into and trying to experiment with something that is juicy. I mean, if you think back to like Sierra Nevada days, I mean, that wasn't a descriptor at all for good reason because everything was piney, like like citrus, citrus, and pine, yeah. orange mm-hmm. peel, grapefruit peel. I mean, bitter was the thing. So now it's all new tools that people can experiment with. So of course, new styles will come from that. And as new hops evolve, as we're seeing new, I mean, we're seeing lots of new like Bright Lemon Drop Hops, um, Idaho 7, things that are coming out um, from hop farmers that brewers are just going to react to. So I think new IPA styles are going to come from that. So you think that the the hop farms and the experimentation at the on the growing side is going to push where we yes. go stylistically in the next five years? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean... You know, people aren't sitting around like twiddling thumbs being like, I don't know, what next? Like, it's like, hey, we have this new thing. How can we, what can we do with it? What, what is the, what's, we have these juicy, like drippy, like Mandarin, Mandarin Bavaria, uh, you know, hops that now have like all yeah, of the aroma. Noble hops, yeah. yeah, even Noble hops are different. Mm-hmm. Hala Blanc, like things that are just new. And so is now it? it's how do you showcase those profiles, showcase the aroma, showcase the flavor, it's also a l- more isolated flavor and a more isolated flavor or aroma than before, where you'd have like the mixed bitterness with the, it. The with kettle like a general hop. spice or whatever, just yeah. kind of a generic. Yeah, you know. yeah exactly. How, how competitive is it for both of you guys to get those hops? I'd say it's. How do we get Galaxy, Kate? <laughs> From Pipeworks. We're going to go on the, the back of the deep web. We uh, need it. <laughs> yeah. No, um, it, you know, it's, it is competitive. It's definitely, and things go away. I mean, we were just kind of having a discussion within the brewery about like Nelson hops and how much we miss them, how much we miss Nelson hops, but also like, it's not really something that you get anymore. And so it's kind of just gone. And when we do get galaxy, we hold on to it. Um, it's it's definitely. But you can't hold on to it too long, right? Or else they. I mean, we sell it in yeah, our yeah. basements next to radiators. <laughs> the warm basement. Uh, <laughs> in front of the light. Studio B, may <laughs> I suggest <laughs> for some of your excess? No, we we try to turn it as fast as as possible. But I I just mean like you know with any uh, procuring anything new and exciting, uh, you have to treat it like it's it's a. I mean, it is an organic fleeting thing, so you might not get it again. And some of those hops, too, are being used in a lot of those uh, emerging or growing styles we talked about earlier, the blondes and the Kolsch's and the Pilsners and all that stuff. I think a lot of those mm-hmm. new hops are getting mixed into those beers, and it makes they it a little should. more exciting for yeah. all of us. And, and some of these little guys I have found are using some more of these exotic hops because in small quantities, I believe you can buy them on, on a spot market at an exorbitant price, but for a small batch, maybe you can make that up but if you're going to do it at a larger batch it just becomes it doesn't become feasible anymore to kind of buy huge amounts of hops on the spot market for crazy prices so some of these little guys are using Mm -hmm. these you know small amounts of these exotic hops pipeworks is a great example of someone who used to do that Um, it still kind of does to some degree but i mean you guys used to have so cool (laughs) <laughs> I'm not saying you're not cool. Yeah, no. I don't think that's necessarily cool, but <laughs> it's yeah. Without a tap room, uh, Nelson doesn't ah. really or Galaxy really doesn't really make much sense. It's True. thirty plus a pound. Gives us some. And ideas. Nelson, you're not going to throw that into a ten dollar four pack. Also, Nelson is not what it. Nelson has that hop has changed exactly. more than any. It doesn't other hop. taste it, but when it first came out, it was like you know, Incredible. whoa, best like, hop, bright, I'd, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a memorable, memorable flavor. You couldn't um, blend to uh, imitate it. Alpine nope. Nelson, yeah, that beer. So can yep, you can you just to like put it yeah. in the in the context of the uh, the beer drinker? Like, what are some beers that you guys made with Nelson that really like showcase Nelson? Um, we you yeah had a bunch I, of Nelson yeah stuff. we had a like a whole string of them because we were just you know that's <laughs> just what we had everything yeah kind of. Um, so 
Uh, BJ's Weirdo Brown and you <laughs> did a did Super exist. Nelson Brown Ale. We did a Nelson Brown Ale. Um, we did um, uh, we did like just you know a lot of just like Nelson Ninja. S- we did. <laughs> yeah. Did you really? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think Bobby Minnelli's on that label. Anyways, oh. uh, but yeah, we did a single double or an IPA with just Nelson hops. Um, pretty much a lot. We did like a summer ale. I mean, there was a lot of things where it was also kind of peppered in, and so there's oh, that summer ale was awesome. Yeah, I'll never see it again. You know, I mean, there's yeah. things like what was the name of it? Had like a wolf howling at the moon or something on the cover um, on the label. It, I think it was. I forget what the actual name was. Yeah, but, I yeah. Can't. English the, summer ale or something yeah. it was. The degree to which people awesome. sort of understand that craft beer is this thing and – or just beer. Well, I'll say craft beer as in opposition to big beer. But is like this thing that's – it's not a fixed thing like what you're mm-hmm. saying. It's like someone asked me on the Twitter tonight, what's your favorite IPA? And it's it's like – I don't know. There's just – I feel like there's so much variation between batches even from like really – good Absolutely. established breweries that there's no one answer to that like it's always right. just this thing in flux and that's kind of what's awesome about it how do you like to yeah. get your pizza do you always get your pizza the exact same way every single time or do you want yes. it a little From different jets, lots of corners yeah. very, there you very go. but you can get <laughs> your that's pizza the same way every time you know and it's you like can. and there might you can get your ipa the same every time yeah well you can and can't right i mean if you want goose island ipa to taste the same every time you can probably get that Right. But okay. I, well, then, what's your favorite fruit? You know, even if you ha- only want to have the same right, fruit all the time, that's a good it's example. Not right. Taste exactly. The same. Mango will taste am different I in, in Philippines or am I in right. California. Sure. Yeah. All yeah. that. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, there's definitely times I look back at sort of like the Piperx catalog, and I'm like, oh, I really miss those days when we had this hop. Like that was a good chunk of beers that we put out, and it was because it was peppered with this one hop that we had at the time, and we might have that hop again. But it will not be the same season. It won't it's be the same batch. It's kind of beautiful in a way. I yeah. like that. Exactly. Yeah. That's what's so I mean, great about it. That's what's craft. Yeah, man. <laughs> High five. High indie. Five. No, it's indie. Independence. It's independent. Independence. That's what's oh, independent. That's a good segue, too. Should oh. we have that discussion? Um, ah. we Was that to? on the list? It might have been. But I think so we could talk about Wait, method what's the traditional. Oh, but you know what? Let's do a letter. I mean, we haven't done a letter in a couple weeks, and I, I would like to get to a letter. Um so if that's okay with everybody, sure. it's uh, so as as Josh is is looking up the the Cub score, uh, I will inform everyone that if they want to participate in the show, a great way is one obviously to hop into the chat room. Another way is to write a letter. You can write that electronically at insiders at craftbeertemple dot com. Uh, Josh does not look very happy right no, now. No, no, no. I was okay. just waiting for it to load. It looks okay. like it's still seven four. Okay. In the sixth. There you go. Good um, stuff. Be so, excited, Tim. <laughs> so you can uh, yeah, send uh, an electronic see. letter to insiders at craftbeertemple.com or an actual handwritten or hand-typed letter. Uh, is that Juan Kim making fun of us? Okay. No. It's uh, in your picture, I was saying. embarrassing picture that Tim oh. took of me. So anyway, um, as everyone is uh, – it's fun. Everyone, like, on their phones. Look it down. No, it's fine. I'm being – you said letter, okay. and we just trailed yeah, off, right? <laughs> we were typing a letter. We were so if you want to, if you want to type, if you want to type a letter, print it out and and send it here. That's thirty two nineteen South Morgan Street. That's the Co Prosperity Sphere, Bridgeport, Chicago six zero six zero eight. Send it to my attention or anyone's attention. Hopefully, it'll show up. Someone sent a letter. We haven't written uh, read a, a, a written letter in a long time. So. Someone write. Was it handwritten or typed and printed? We've we've had them all. We've had a hand delivered letter. We've had uh, handwritten letters. We've had type like old fashioned, actually on a typewriter letters. Awesome. Mm. We haven't had any of those in a while though. So I'm calling you guys out. We're the best darn beer podcast in existence in the so, galaxies. Yeah, in the galaxy, at least one galaxy. Galaxies. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm just gonna. I'm throwing the gauntlet down and saying we are the best in multiple galaxies. So. Is it too much to get a darn handwritten letter, guys? Come Let's on. go. Guys and gals. So anyway, Nick writes electronically. <laughs> um, <laughs> just kidding. Thanks, Nick, for the letter. Um, here it's Chris. I've always wondered about this. 
But with the recent, I've always wondered about this, but with the recent controversy Jester King has sparked with Method Traditionale, it's all at the forefront of my mind again. The new designation sparked off a response from DeGarde calling out other breweries for essentially overpricing their sour beers. I've huh. always been astonished by the low prices DeGarde sells its beers for, especially when it's hard to find a non-kettle soured beer here in the Midwest for less than 12 or 15 bucks to 750 Parentheses reading Birvana today, I noticed that Flattail sells one of its sours for five ninety nine to seven fifty. Literally, the only seven fifty I could find around here that cheap would be Lagunitas. Then a little research revealed that Cantillon sells nearly the same in sells for nearly the, the same in Belgium. So if these breweries are selling their sour beer for far less than everyone else and seeming to be doing just fine why don't we see more lower price sour beers is it a prestige pricing thing taking advantage of the higher prices by set uh, set by imports since they have higher shipping costs and rarity built in there's also another tier there there's the import tier um that's me talking not nick uh back to nick now is this oregon model bound to catch on or will they continue to be the exception to the rule thank you nick for that letter that's a good thoughtful letter right there yeah so i guess basically he's saying why are sour beers so expensive not everybody is charging that much for them so does that mean that everybody has to um no and i would say there's also a great podcast uh the sour hour with the degard brewer i can't remember his name um but it's a great Oh, an episode. Because the yes. host is, owns, Sorry. Is, is at the Rare Barrel. A guest, but, yeah, yes, but an interview. Um, Trevor where, where from he's Degard, yeah. sort of goes into detail about this. And, you know, he seems to be the exception in the industry as far as pricing. Um, but he does kind of blow everybody's minds with uh, the beers that they produce and the prices they put them out at. Some of them are. It's, it, it, it's, it's it was, delicious. Yeah, I've talked about it here on the show. I mean, I was dumbfounded when I went out there and had 750s of a... Of a goza, but of a spontaneously fermented barrel soured goza for like which you basically five, never, six never dollars see, for right? a seven fifty. Yeah, and then they had a dry hop one for like seven dollars to seven fifty. Well, six ninety nine to five ninety nine. And you know the bottle and the label is a dollar or two. You know whatever. It's, it's the I mean, asked them about that? it. So we have an interview with Trevor. From, from years ago, a video uh, that you can see on our website. So go look it up. We do talk to him about that at the time, too, a little bit. But what were you going to say? Just the irony is that this is what everyone is uh, afraid of Anheuser-Busch doing, accusing Anheuser-Busch of doing, which I don't think there's really that much evidence that they actually are doing it. Doing what? Undercutting the market. There's, a, there's some. Not really. I mean, they're, okay. just, they're, they're yeah. not... I mean, some there is some, yes. Like, there are the $55 kegs or whatever in Seattle, that kind of thing. Um, but, like, sort of this concentrated effort to... I mean, they're, they're the cheapest 12-pack of IPA you're going to find in the store, absolutely. But are they cheaper than Lagunitas? No. I mean, they're, they're competing with Sam Adams and Lagunitas at that lower price point. Um, but everyone is concerned about them pulling the rug out on price and they're at the bottom to compete yes but they haven't done it in that way and so right now we're talking about this brewery in oregon is making world-class sour beers at this price why isn't everyone doing that i mean trevor told me that he thought he needed to do that to compete in the local market this was years Mm -hmm. ago but that's what he told me that's a huge market yeah, he said Portland. It probably you know, for him too, you right? can't move this beer at that price in this town. I mean, people just aren't going to even consider it if it's you know over so and so amount. And he did does uh, Degard does make beers that are pricier um, comparatively. Um, some of their uh, fruited um, well, they sour beers. They don't do like IPAs and stuff, right? No, I don't. I don't believe they do. So I guess they need to compete somewhere. Yeah. Their beers are really delicious. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a, a competitive advantage for going low and a competitive advantage for going high. So, I mean, it's also possible that other sour producers where the letter writer is writing from um, have taken the stance that if you're going to price your stuff a little bit higher, it gives the impression or the illusion or something being of like a certain 
caliber or it um, – Yeah. A lot can factor into it. I, I will say that um, Nick mentions that – it's hard for him to find oh a non kettle soured beer in the Midwest for less than twelve to fifteen to seven fifty. I think that's I that's, think that's about, fair. That's fair. Yeah. yeah, that is fair. And you know, I personally think that those beers took a lot of time to make. Yeah, they do. And you know, I, I don't. It's see a that. very limited part of our market. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, there's still very little wood age beers that are. Yeah, and I I would like to quickly mention that there's like a comedy show going on. They're, they're, they're uh, not cheering the speaker for us, you mean? is so loud, and all the people watching are within, like, a 20-foot radius, and they're just blasting it. Anyway, I think that's I think they're cheering pretty for the funny. They're, watching, funny. For the, they're yeah. watching the game. But anyway, oh, yeah. you're saying, yeah, the, the acquiring the wood and aging it in wood. Well, it just, it's, it's a limited part of our market, uh, yeah. whereas other markets are saturated with that. Um, I think, you know, people are certainly picking up steam on that. We're doing that. Off Color is opening a tap room doing that. You know, there's plenty of people mm-hmm. doing those things now, finally. Um, but for some reason, it just hasn't been a part of our market for a long time. It's it's There's different investments. There's different considerations that were made by the brewers and the breweries to do that. Um, they have to charge something for it. You can't just – there there's uh, reasons that it – comes out at the prices that it does i, w- I would think so yeah. yeah yeah i mean it just sits there it's, it's an investment that just sits there forever and it may not come out it might get dumped on the drain but it's also so hard for breweries to do like long fermentation mm-hmm. or aging barrel mm-hmm. age programs in cities like chicago and new york and other places where you know huge temperature swings yeah and i guess different. you could say that about you know yeah about a lot of regions but so yeah there's just a lot of variables that you know, I don't know. There's <laughs> different ways to cut it up, but so I, I mean, I, I personally feel that if it were easy to make these beers, these non kettle soured sour beers, and if they were easy to produce and cheap to produce and easy to make a ton of margin on, we'd be flooded with them. Everyone yep. would be doing it. Yep. So I, I don't think that it's just easy to crank these beers out it's and make not. a ridiculous margin on. No. I think it's probably very difficult to make them well. It takes a lot of attention, a lot of, you know, checks and, and you mm-hmm. know, just it, it's a lot of work in different ways that you just can't throw it out there for $7 a bottle, in my opinion. Uh, no disrespect to DeGard or anybody else. It's awesome that they want to do that and they successfully do that and operate a business that way. That's great. But a lot of places, it's just not uh, a smart way to do those beers. And you're yeah. talking wood beers, not kettle sours? Yeah, wood age beers, either yeah. food or beers, you know, whatever, pungents, barrels. But yeah. it all it, it takes space, work, time, attention, you know, staffing, just so I wonder how hours of work. Financially, how that works out for them. Do you know, based on your previous talks with him? What do you mean? Like, how are they doing? Well, I mean, just uh, how, what, to what degree are they making a sacrifice by selling those beers at that price? Are they taking a loss? I mean, they can't, they can't be taking a loss. They're taking a loss, it. and they're taking a loss on everything they do because everything they do pretty much falls into that category. I mean, maybe some of their— How do they take a loss on everything they do and continue to survive? No, I, I, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm saying I don't think they are. I mean, maybe they're, they're some of their, like their, um, their gozas and stuff like that— are closer to you know that much narrower margin They're than the other beers. beers. I don't know. Yeah, I do know that um, Trevor from DeGard kind of was calling out people for charging too much for in his in his estimation for some of these beers and almost like you know price gouging based on this air of exclusivity and and stuff like that, which it does get a little. I mean, we can briefly talk about. This uh, this discussion about this uh, sour and wild ale guild it was referred to this method traditional method goose we talked about method goose um, from Jester King before they've changed it to method traditional we're going to be talking about it more in in future weeks but um, it is interesting that there is this guild forming I guess that's what they is that what they want to call it or. Um, authority or whatever, yeah. Posse. Sour and Wild Ale Guild or something like that group. A, a, a crew. It's a crew. crew. Yeah. Squad. Squad. Mm-hmm. Squad. Squad. <laughs> Squad. So I think that's, you know, something that they want to protect. We were talking about a little bit during the is break. What we need more of is like more exclusionary-ness. Is that a word? 
It is now. What is the need? And so craftier. what is the need for a, a, a group, like a squad like this? I, Silence. Brewers? That is speaks a lot. I mean, it's it's a style that is probably the most misunderstood or not understood by consumers i would say uh, you know if you if you pulled a bunch of craft beer you know mouthfeel bros <laughs> they probably mouthfeel uh, how do the mouthfeel horse <laughs> feel about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> they probably couldn't tell you what a lambic is they probably couldn't tell you what a goose is um it's it's an important issue i think that needs to get sorted out it would be nice to know what american brewers are supposed to call this beer why but, can't they just call it lambic yeah, exactly. Uh, well, no, the, I mean, the they, Belgians don't like they that. They can't, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, they can. They can. They can. They can. If you want to make enemies, but, you know, it sounds like they're all enemies with each other in Belgium an, anyway. I don't know. I don't know. And then they shouldn't, should they not be able to make an I mean, you can't call IPA? Should right. we not be able to make an IPA? Because we didn't invent IPA. We need IPA? another guild. I think it, in Belgium, there is a group, it's called Oral, H-O-R-A-L, that is kind of an authority locally who dictates what can be called, you know, out of goose, lambic, sure. all that sort of stuff. Meth, um, and they, you know, they, I guess, are doing it to protect it. Um, most of the lambic blenders and brewers are a part of that. A, a notable exception is Except Cantillon for, is yeah. not. Yeah, like the, the, the most They're famous not. one of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Why are they not part of it? I bet there's a lot of reasons, but... Yeah. You know, there's th things like uh, some some of the brewers are allowed to pasteurize the beer. And I'm Ooh. guessing that some of the brewers don't appreciate that. I, I don't know. But and there's yeah. there's so, mixed criteria like the same with judging so here. Like Cantillon like, does not make any back sweetened stuff. There are members who make a lot of back sweetened stuff who are in or all. And there are, you know, beers that uh, if if Cantillon was in Oral would not be able to call it goose or lambic because it doesn't have the right um, grain bill. Uh, you know, maybe it doesn't have enough wheat in it, uh, stuff like that. And I think from what I have heard, uh, you know, Cantillon is going to say, don't tell me that this is not a traditional lambic because I have bar I added barley to this one. Um, now, sometimes they do actually fall in line with like the traditional naming conventions but i don't think they want to be held to it and uh that's the danger of the, yeah of what somebody rules, else is saying when they consider themselves very I, traditional i do think that there's a positive in sort of the protective nature of guilds i mean for example like cheese has a lot of you know protective guilds wine. regulations wine you know the there's ton. like in italy there's the dog the dogg uh, it just goes on and on and on um is and there a D-O-G-G-G? -G -G? There's yeah. a doggy. That's the third one. It's Yo, dog. That's the one I want to join. <laughs> yeah, it's very exclusive. The D-O-double-G, <laughs> you see, is how they... That's where Snoop got the idea, actually. It is. It he is. Was a it's from fine Italian wine. wine. Connoisseur. Yeah. He loved a good Nebbiolo. Yeah, exactly. We know that about Snoop Dogg. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he raps about it. Yeah. Gin and juice, Nebbiolo. That's yep. the guy's jam. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it makes sense in those ways where, you know, if you are protecting a method... Um, if you're protecting a specific style, uh, it makes sense, I think, in a lot of ways. I'm what styles evolve, trying too, right? to figure out if that's what's happening. I, maybe I'm just not, I don't know, Tim, you probably know more than I do. I understand, I'm looking at you. I understand the perspective of if you're going to put forward the same thing we talked about earlier with just general sour beers, put forward the investment, the space, the time, the resources to do these beers – you want people to understand that you made it in a certain way with certain parameters, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, it just feels more exclusive than inclusive. Yeah. And w the people that are going to go and get a little back pat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said the same thing. Yes. Kate <laughs> said the same thing earlier. Um, it's, it's the people that are going to go and seek out these beers from any domestic brewery know what it is they know how it was made they know that it's in the lambic style i would argue do they need to know and have this stamp of approval on it yeah I don't man know. but are they independent that's what i want to know <laughs> right. i don't really give i don't care how How many stamps are going to well, be on our time label i soon. heard of the of excuse black, me i, I yeah. have breaking news eight four cubs oh, there you go oh, cubs so the first time I ever heard of Black Project Ales, and we've had James from, from Black Project on the show in the past. I was on that show. Yeah. Uh, and he is one of the, the, the guys who was working very closely 
with Jester King actually went over to Belgium and you know worked on this whole method traditional um, write up and definition. Which is an incredible project. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't think anyone. Uh, yeah, and I think that's important to to say. I mean, this is has nothing to do with how awesome it is that these beers well, are being Spot made. Was and like, stuff the, like that. the thing I like sought out at Fobab last year and will yeah. do again. I mean, yeah. everything that they're doing there. Jeff, Avery, they're all doing, like, incredible work that's good for the brewing community at large. Couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, what I wanted to say was uh, that the first time I heard of Black Project Dales was when they, ha- you know, made some waves when, with a, a T-shirt that said, I think, Death to Kettle Sours. It was the first time I heard of, of, of Black Project. And then, you know, when you started listening to what the guy what the guy james was saying was like well you know, i don't hate kettle sours but i want people to know the difference and i think that maybe that's what this is as well like all right there's kettle sour beer beers there's you know maybe barrel fermented and barrel aged sour beers and then there's this method traditional where you know they're three years old and they're blended and they're spontaneously fermented and you know it it in that sense if they're differentiating them, my guess is they're not differentiating them for flavor. To be like, why doesn't this taste like really clean and lemony and light? Like mm-hmm. you know, this six pack I just picked up for ten bucks. My guess is that it is to differentiate them from a pricing standpoint, so they can you know charge yeah. more for it because they put more work into it. Yeah, I just wish it was differentiating like a new. S- Step. Does it differentiate a new, like a new, so there's what traditional goose is, what traditional lambic is, and that's what they weren't able to define their beer as. But if then, if there was like a new, if they were defining like a newer way to do it or a different way or a different method, I think that would be a distinction, like a regional or a new sort of American. Uh, yeah, I don't see the reason to attach ourselves or try to like, say that we're doing what they're doing but we are doing what they're doing and it's just like they need to deal with it oh no in many ways we are but it's it's also just maybe you're not going to quite get the mineral qualities of their version of this beer or whatever mineral qualities of some are exactly so why do we need to it's it's you know that's where those other guilds like like the dog super tuscans and the dog gg yeah yeah dogg why not just say it's a spontaneous beer blended two or three years whatever you're doing and just it's it's worth what it's worth. I guess your cool ship, and cool ship from cool Allagash ship beer, has been whatever. doing it for a while, and yeah. that's. I mean, I think most people who buy that stuff realize understand what, what that it is. is. Yeah, and that it's special. And I think that that's more clear maybe to some consumers than saying lambic or goose or whatever. Why? Why do we have to try to be them? I mm-hmm. guess I, I just don't see the. And, and the motivation by, you mean for that. by even having sort of the umbrella term? Yeah, like who cares if. If it's a beautiful, spontaneous beer that's been blended properly and aged and whatever, it meets all the criteria for this, the, what they're doing over there. But it's our version. It's it's a domestic version of that that doesn't agree. have to be called a lambic. I think there's some romanticization that comes on uh, Americans to like what's happening or what has happened in beer in Belgium. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of similar things mm-hmm. that have happened. I mean, it's. It do, we don't need to have. I don't, I don't know. But it still needs to be described some way in like sure. a consumer yeah. facing way, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. Yep. it's very American to want to put a label on this thing and it's well, like just a word this that, that, like that means something to. We need more categories. Consumer. So it needs to be American oh, Wild I? Ale. There needs to be <laughs> Method Traditional. Method Traditional Three Year, which is the sub de- designation they've come out with. Quick and then spontaneous. Kettle Sour, Quick Spontaneous. Uh, you know, yeah. all those things. <laughs> Cool Ship Lager, which yeah. only Dovetail will be uh, allowed to enter. Yep. And um, no, I mean, I, I love the beers. I am curious to see what the so, motivation is and, and why. And is so, it as needed? someone, Tim, who makes like sour beer, like, I mean, we were just trying your creek. And we're like, hey, that's, that's really good. I mean, like, do you feel like there's certain designations that would feel kind of like a diss? Or, like, things that are almost, like, subcategories in a way where it's, like, I mean, we, you know. s- we started doing, <clears throat> excuse me, we started doing Kettle Sours originally, you know, several years ago. And that was something that we just tried and started and just experimenting. And we decided we didn't like the results of that. So we stopped doing that mm-hmm. and started uh, doing a, a quicker souring in a steel fermenter. 
um, average about a month of fermentation time and ended up contaminating our lacto and, you know, getting a mixed thing. That's cool. what we use today. And, you know, to hear that back in the time, the same thing of, you know, dissing kettle sours and everything, it's, it, it felt kind of more same thing not inclusive it's just a diss of because, people's process and now did it, you work with white labs to the or not white labs uh with omega to then isolate yeah we made our own exactly. lacto off okay. of grains See, and, and tried a bunch of things and you know did a bunch of experimentation with that and you know we put our time into it in a way that we could with the facility and the means that we had and i think mm-hmm. a lot of places um you know a lot of places have concerns about contamination and you know, ruining their, their clean beers with those kinds of things. And we we didn't have that mentality, but we also just kind of did what we could. And I think a lot of breweries do that. And the, how do you get one last one in? Hey, the the dissing, the the kettle sours thing, just, I don't think so. We have two minutes. It can be done well. It can be done very poorly. And so can a wood aged sour beer. And so can everything else. I think you guys have done the most work as far to, to create a kettle sour. I mean, I don't think that kettle sour is always a, a cheap, quick, easy it doesn't have to be thing it doesn't have to be because yeah. if you spend the time to isolate the right amount yeah. uh the balance and yeah. what you're actually creating that lact i mean not every lacto strain is the same yeah. not everything is and our strain is up. super hop sensitive exactly. so we were not concerned about ruining our bottling line we, we don't doing I, these different right. things i know you guys are nerding out we have one minute left can we <laughs> yeah. just are name we going like, to talk about the cubs again? no i just want to know what brewery everyone hates the most tim go <laughs> no <laughs> Uh, oh, any <laughs> final words, Josh? Go Cubs, I'm assuming. Uh, go Cubs. All right, Kate. Let's talk about that lactose strain. So when you <laughs> yeah. And Tim. This has been fun. Cool. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks, John. Had to go in the same way we went out, I see. It's 8-4. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Easy on that slider. 8-4. Eight, 8-4 four. Eight, four in the I bottom of the I want to thank my guests, Josh, Kate, <laughs> and Tim. I want to thank producer John and everyone else. We will see you next week with more of the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Let's talk more about Lacto, guys. Yeah. Bye. Ah, good night. Do you really want to talk more about Lacto, Chris? Again, again, again.